Now, the next category is Samabhadana. And there are four of them, and actually they do not have names, so their description is very long. First, the word Samabhadana. It is made up of Samma and Padhana. Now, Samma you will find in Samma Diti and so on. So the same Samma. And Padhana means making effort or practice. Samma means in a proper way. So making effort in a proper way is called Samma Padhana. And it is translated into English as supreme effort. The effort here must not be legs, it must be strong, and so it is translated as supreme efforts. And there are four kinds of efforts mentioned here. And the first one is the effort to discard or to abandon the evil states that have arisen. Now, evil states means unwholesome states. Unwholesome karmas that have arisen in one's mind say, in the past. And this is the effort to get rid of or to discard these evil unwholesome states that have arisen. Now, how do we discard the evil states that have arisen? Actually, the states have already gone. But here, to discard the evil states that have arisen means not to feel remorse about what Akusala or unwholesome act one has done. Now, if we did something that is unwholesome, that is evil, and we have remorse about that act, we actually multiply our unwholesome karma. So by being sorry about that, by being remorseful about that act, we multiply the unwholesome karma. And what has been done is already done and you cannot undo it. So there is no point in feeling remorseful about the evil, unwholesome things that have been done. So not thinking about them and doing wholesome deeds instead is what is called the effort to discard evil states that have arisen. And we try not to do such evil states. We try to forget about these evil acts we have done, and instead we do what is good or what is wholesome, and that is the effort to discard evil states that have arisen. And the second is the effort to prevent the arising of unarisen evil states. Now, there may be some unwholesome karma that we have not done in the past. And to prevent unwholesome karma that has not arisen in our mind is called this second one, the effort to prevent the arising of unarisen evil states. Suppose you have not killed an animal. Since you have not killed an animal, killing animal is an unarisen evil state for you. And if you kill an animal now, then you are having the unarisen evil state arise in you. So preventing or avoiding killing an animal is the effort to prevent the arising of unarisen evil states. There may be unarisen evil states in our minds, and we try to avoid doing those evil or unwholesome 
acts that we have not done before. So that is one aspect of this supreme effort. And the third is the effort to develop unarisen wholesome states. That means some wholesome states may not have been done by you before. And now you do these wholesome states and that means the, the, you make an effort to develop an arisen wholesome state. Suppose you have not practiced meditation before and now you practice meditation. So when you practice meditation you make an effort and that effort is to develop an arisen wholesome state. Because since you have not meditated before, the meditation which is a wholesome state has not arisen in your mind before and now you are doing this and so you make the effort to develop the unarisen wholesome state. And the fourth one is the effort to augment arisen wholesome states. That means the effort to do the wholesome states you already have done. So you do it again and again. Uh, you practice dana again and again. You keep sila again and again. You practice meditation again and again. And so making effort to do the wholesome act that you have done before is called the effort to augment or the effort to develop a risen wholesome state. So a risen wholesome state is the ones you have done before and then you do them again and again. So there are four kinds of uh, the supreme efforts and two regarding the unwholesome states and two regarding the wholesome states. Two regarding the unwholesome states are the unwholesome states that have arisen before and that have not arisen before. Wholesome states are also the same. So regarding the unwholesome states, we try to uh, get rid of the unwholesome states that have already arisen and try to avoid or prevent the unwholesome states that have not yet arisen from arising in your mind. And regarding the wholesome, you try to do some wholesome states that you have not done before and you do the wholesome state that you have done before again and again. So uh, these are four kinds of supreme efforts and according to the ultimate reality, all four are just one viriya or one chetisika which is effort. And the next category is Edhipada and there are four of them. Edhipada is translated as means to accomplishment. Now Edhi and Pada. Now Edhi means accomplishment or power and literally Pada means feet of a foot. So the feet or the base for the accomplishment is called Edhi Pada. And Edhi here can mean the sublime or mahagada and supramundane states. Uh, there are different kinds of powers, uh, magic powers uh, that can be reached or obtained by the practice of jhana, by the practice of samatha meditation. And having the will to do, to attain that state making effort, having the mind, or consciousness and investigating or using the knowledge to attain those states is called Edhipada. And there are four here mentioned, Chanda Edhipada. So that is the will to do and Viriya Edhipada, that is Viriya or effort or energy, and three, chit-tik-dhi-pada, that is consciousness, 
and we must the bada, we must the bada. It is investigation or amoha knowledge. So these are the four means of accomplishment or four bases of accomplishment. These four Adibadas are identical with the four predominant or Adibadis mentioned in the last section. Uh, why these states become predominant on any occasion when they are instrumental in accomplishing a goal, they become Adibadas only when they are applied to achieving the goal of the Buddha's teaching. So, when they are predominant, and one of them is predominant, and it is called Adhi, and when they become instrumental in accomplishing a goal, is called Adhipada. So, Adhipada can be both mundane and supramundane. But uh, mostly uh, it is uh, mundane power uh, that is called AD. And the next category is category of Indriya again. We, we have these five here mentioned again because here they are the members of enlightenment or body Pakya Dhammas. And there are five Saddha Indriya that is the Chetisika Sadha, Viriya Indriya, Sati Indriya, Samadhi Indriya, and Panya Indriya. They are called Indriya because they exercise authority in their own respective areas or respective fields. And these five faculties exercise control in the spheres of resolution regarding the Sadha Indriya. Now, Sadha faith or confidence has the element of resolution. So before you believe in something, you make a resolution. This is it or something like that. So there is the element of resolution. And so Sadha Indriya exercises control over this resolution when it comes to getting faith or confidence in something. And Viriya Indriya, effort, making effort, and making effort is exertion, and so Viriya is, Viriya exercises control over the exertion. And the Satyendriya exercises control over awareness or mindfulness, and Samadindriya exercises control over non-distraction. Now when mind is Concentrated, it is not distracted, and so it is said to control non-distraction. And the Panyendriya or Amoha exercises control over understanding or discernment. So they are called Indriya or faculties. Now, if you have been to a meditation retreat, especially Vipassana retreat, you may have heard the teacher say the balancing of the faculties. So when you practice meditation, especially vipassana meditation, balancing or keeping the five faculties in balance is very important. If they are not balanced, if one of them is in excess of the others, then your meditation uh, becomes ruined. You will be not successful in the practice of meditation. And so it is important that these five faculties should be kept in proper balance when you practice meditation. Especially there should be balance of sadha, the faith, and number five, panya. Faith and understanding should be balanced. That means you must not have too much faith or too much understanding. If you have too much faith, you will believe in anything. You will not have any judgment. So you will be a credulous person if you have too much faith. 
and you will fall an easy prey to religious imposters or something. And if you have too much understanding, you tend to be crafty. You tend to be dishonest. Because you know too much, uh, you can argue and win the argument uh, whether what you argue about is really correct or not. Now, the commentaries give the, the example of a man who is too wise. Now, dana. Dana is defined as volition of giving of volition uh, when you give. So, he may say that without giving anything, you can have dana. You can practice dana. <laughs> because dana is volition, and so you can invoke that volition in your mind, and then you practice dana. So you don't have to give, or you don't have to donate anything at all. But actually, that is impossible, because... The volition of dana can arise in your mind only when you give something, only, only when you practice dana. If you do not practice dana, if you do not practice giving, then that volition of giving cannot arise in your mind. But he might say that volition can arise without giving anything, and so he will not practice dana at all, and he may even and prevent other people from doing dana and so on, and so he acquire a lot of demerit or unwholesome karma. So it is important that the faith and understanding should be balanced. If you have too much faith in the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha, then you have to contemplate on the nature of all phenomena, that all, all phenomena are impermanent, suffering and non-soul, and so everything arises and disappears, everything is impermanent, and so uh, there is uh, nothing to be uh, too much attached to. And if you have too much understanding, that means your faith level is very low. So in that case, you step up your faith level by listening to Dhamma talks, by reading books, or by talking with somebody who is more knowledgeable than you are in the field of uh, Dhamma. So in this way, you balance the faith and understanding. And this is not only possible during meditation, but it is possible or it should be maintained in your life also. Because when following a teaching, when following a religion, we need to have this balance of faith and understanding. And too much faith will lead you uh, to, to believing in anything, in discriminate believing, and too much understanding will lead you to craftiness. So, your faith and your Understanding should be balanced. Sometimes people are too intelligent, they think too much, and then they spend time or they waste time just by examining this and that and they don't do anything really rewarding. Sometimes people will say, oh, chanting is not really taught by the Buddha. <laughs> so, there is no use in chanting and so on. So if you have too much understanding, too much uh, intellect, you may even think that way. Uh, so if you don't do that, you, you, do, you don't get wholesome karma. So you listen to the chanting and you get peace of mind, concentration and so on, and you also gain the faith in the Buddha and so on. And so it is important that faith and understanding must be balanced. And also, especially when you practice meditation, the concentration and effort must be balanced. There should not be too much effort or too much concentration. 
too much effort will make you agitated and you will find you cannot meditate. If you make too much effort, your mind becomes agitated and you cannot concentrate. And if you have too much concentration, you become lazy. Because too much concentration means now it's very easy for you to get concentration and so you don't make a necessary effort. And so you become lazy or you become sleepy and you may be nodding like this <laughs> when you practice meditation. So if for no apparent reason you are nodding like that, please note that the concentration might be too much. So in that case you have to do something say, to reduce the level of concentration. So when there is too much effort, then you, you slow down. Take the uh, attitude of, I don't care. Th that is what I say to yogis. Have the I don't care attitude. Sometimes people are too eager to achieve something and so they make much effort and the more effort they make, the less they can concentrate. So in that case, just slow down and I don't care whether I get concentration or not, but I will just be mindful of the object at the present moment. You slow down and practice. If you think you have too much concentration, then you step up your energy by paying closer attention to the object or by increasing the number of objects you make notes of. For example, when you are practicing meditation and you are making notes of just two things, in, out, in, out, or rising, falling, rising, falling, and if you think you have too much concentration, you can add some more uh, objects as object of meditation like say, in, out, sitting, in, out, sitting, or rising, falling, sitting, rising, falling, sitting. Or you may add more like uh, touching, 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 and so on. So by taking more objects at a time, you step up your energy. So when energy level rises, concentration becomes slowed down. So concentration and energy or effort should be balanced so that your meditation is good. Then what about sati, mindfulness? Now it is said that there is no such thing as excess mindfulness. So mindfulness cannot be too much. So you need to have strong mindfulness any time, all the time. Mindfulness is a regulating mental factor. So when mindfulness is uh, developed, it keeps the other mental faculties in proper balance. It is compared to uh, putting salt in every dish. So when you cook dishes, you put salt in it. So salt is everywhere. In the same way, mindfulness should is needed everywhere. So there can be no excess of mindfulness. So when you practice meditation, you have to keep these five mental faculties in proper balance by developing mindfulness and by doing something so that they are not in excess of uh, each other. So these are the five mental faculties that are the members of enlightenment. And then next category is the category of bala or power and they are actually the same as the five indriyas or faculties. When we call them indriya, uh, we emphasize their ability to exercise authority over their respective area. And when we call them bala, I mean power, we emphasize their strength. We emphasize they are not being shaken by the opposites. And the next category is the category of bodhyanga, factors of enlightenment. The word bodhyanga 
For convenience sake, it is translated as factors of enlightenment. Now, the word bodhyanga is made up of the word bodhi and anga. Bodhi and anga. Now, bodhi has two meanings here. One is a person who has practiced vipassana meditation and reached the stage of descending, rising and falling. That kind of person is called body. And anga means the cause or the member. So the cause of or the member of the person who has reached that stage in the practice of meditation. Also, body means the group of mental factors that arise at the moment of enlightenment. So at the moment of enlightenment, these the sati, dhamma, vijaya and so on arise. The group of these seven are called body and each one of them are called bodhyanga. So bodhyanga can be translated as factors of enlightenment or factors of a person who has reached the stage of discerning rise and fall in the practice of vipassana meditation. And there are seven of them and the first is sati, sambodhyanga, sati. So sati is mindfulness. Mindfulness means a full awareness of the object. Mindfulness is compared to something that sinks into the water and that does not float on the surface. So its characteristic is said to be not floating on the surface. So it must be on the object squarely. It must be the full awareness of the object. And that is sati. And the second one is dhamma vichaya sambodhyanga. Vichaya means investigating and dhamma means dhamma. Investigating the dhamma. And investigating the dhamma means investigating the mind and matter. Now when you practice vipassana meditation, you take either mind or matter as object. Being mindful of the mind or matter, the object that is at the present moment, you develop concentration and through concentration you come to see the true nature of mind and matter. When you see the true nature of mind and matter, this bojanga, this dhamma vijya bojanga is said to have arisen. So dhamma vijya sambojanga is actually the understanding the correct understanding of the object of meditation, correct understanding of mind and matter, or correct understanding of the five aggregates. Because when you practice vipassana, you concentrate on the five aggregates. And number three is viriya sampojanga, viriya making effort. So you have to make effort to be mindful. This effort is mental effort, not physical effort. So actually when you practice meditation you don't do physical effort or you don't do much physical effort. But you have to make a mental effort. If you do not make a mental effort you cannot be mindful, you cannot practice meditation. So making effort is called viriya sambodhyanga. And how much effort must we make? We must have strong resolution when we practice meditation. It is called four-limbed effort. That means let my skin, bones and sinews remain. Let my flesh and blood dry up. But I will not desist from making effort until I reach the stage I am after until I reach the stage of enlightenment. So with that resolution, you must make effort. That is what Buddha taught to his disciples. And that is what he did when he sat down under the Bodhi tree 
to practice meditation to become the Buddha. So after sitting down under the Bodhi tree, he said to himself, I will not break this sitting position until I reach Buddhahood, like that. So the effort we make uh, must be a strong effort and not a uh, lax effort. And then Piti Sambhojanga. Piti Sambhojanga is experience uh, when a yogi gains concentration and begins to see the impermanent suffering and non-soul nature of things and especially when a yogi sees the rising and falling. Now in the Dhammapada Buddha said that when a yogi sees the rising and falling of aggregates, he experiences a joy that is non-human. That means not experienced by ordinary human beings, not experienced by those who do not practice meditation. So that kind of joy you experience when you reach a certain stage of uh, vipassana meditation. And number five is pasadhi, tranquility. Tranquility of consciousness and tranquility of mental factors. When there is PT, which is developed, then there arises what is called pasadhi or tranquility. The consciousness as well as the mental factors become tranquil and peaceful. And then number six is samadhi sambhojanga, that is concentration. So concentration is a mental factor which keeps the consciousness and its concomitants on the object or, let's say, stuck to the object and which does not allow the consciousness and mental factors, which does not allow them to be scattered. So, concentration has these two things. It can keep the consciousness and mental factors on the object, and when it keeps them there, it keeps them compact. It does not let them scatter away. So that is what we call samadhi. No, samadhi is not consciousness. Samadhi is a chitasika or a mental state. So that chitasika or mental state can keep the mind on the object and it does not let the components of mind or it does not allow the consciousness and mental factors to be scattered. So when there is samadhi, mind is like the water that has become clear. Before a yogi gets samadhi, his mind is like a muddy water. His mind is uh, contaminated uh, with what are called nivaranas or hindrances. Now you have had, uh, studied the hindrances uh, yesterday. When the hindrances are subdued, when the hindrances settles down, the mind becomes clear. So that is when a yogi gets concentration. Once mind becomes clear, a yogi begins to see the true nature of things. A yogi begins to see the object clearly and he begins to see the characteristic of that object or the features of that object and he begins to see that that object arises and disappears and so on. So what is important for the meditators is to get concentration. Once a yogi gets concentration, understanding or seeing the true nature just follows by itself. You don't have to make a special effort to see the true nature of things. Like when the water becomes clear, you don't have to make another effort to see what's in it. You just see it. So it is important that yogis gain samadhi or concentration or clarity of mind, so that he or she sees the object clearly and the characteristics of that object and also the arising and disappearing of that object. 
Now the last one is Ubika Sambojanga. Now here Ubika does not mean neutral feeling. It is in Pali Tatra Madhyatata equanimity. So this Ubika is not neutral feeling but it is called equanimity, specific neutrality, right? This is like city. So when this factor of enlightenment is strong, then the others are all kept in balance. Since the others are doing their function properly and a yogi doesn't have to make a special effort, then this upika arises. So this upika is compared to a driver of a cart drawn by, say, four horses or eight horses. When the horses are running properly, then the driver doesn't have to make special effort. He just look on and the, the horses are running properly. So in the same way, when upika arises in the mind, then it actually uh, regulates the other factors in their proper balance. And when they are in their proper balance, then there is not much to do for the meditator. So he can just watch and let the meditation flow on and on. So that is what is called Upikha Sambhujanga. So equanimity or a mental factor that watches over the other factors in, in this group. So there are these seven factors of enlightenment. And these seven factors of enlightenment are both mundane and supramundane. Now, strictly speaking, they are supramundane because they are called members of enlightenment. So if they are members of enlightenment, then they must be arising with enlightenment. But if they are called the cause of enlightenment, and they may be mundane also. When you practice vipassana meditation, you experience all of these. You have to develop all the, these factors when you practice vipassana meditation. And so the bhujangas can be both mundane and supramundane. So when you reach the stage of enlightenment, again, these mental states arise. And among them, the sati is the same as samasati among the eight path factors. And the second one, Amoha, or Tamavidya Sambhojanga, is Samadhiti, among the eight path factors. Viriya is Samavayama, and Samadhi is Samasamadhi. And so, these factors that arise with the path consciousness are called path factors. So, there are factors of enlightenment that are also path factors. And so they are to be developed by a yogi. When a yogi is developing them, then they belong to mundane level. And when a yogi achieves his goal and attains enlightenment, then these become supramundane. So the bhajangas are both mundane and supramundane. Now the last category... Magganga, path factors. Now you are all too familiar with the path factors. So the first one is Samaditi Amoha. And the second one is Samasankapa Vitaka. The third, Samavaja, Samavaja. Samakamanda, Samakamanda, Samajiva, Samajiva. Samavayama is Viriya, Samasati is Sati, and Samasamadi is Again, a kagada. So now you see that one and the same mental state is called by different names. 
in the group of Bojangas, it is called the Sadisam Bojanga, and in the eight path factors, and that same mental state is called Samasati and so on. Now the second one is Dhammavitiya Sambojanga among the Bojangas, and it is Samadhiti among the eight uh, path factors. So we must understand what these words denote, what these words stand for uh, regarding the ultimate reality. We may call by different names, but we must know what we are calling by that name. When talking about Bojangas, then we'll say Dhamma Vijaya Sambojanga. And that Dhamma Vijaya Sambojanga is actually the Samma Deity among the eight uh, path factors. Now, among the eight path factors, number two, Samma Sankapa, is a little different. Samma Sankapa is translated as right thought or right intention. Although the Pali word Sankapa means thought, it is not thinking, actually. It is the Chetasiga Vitaka. And what is the function of Chetasiga Vitaka? What is the characteristic of Chetasiga Vitaka? Vitaka is the mental state that puts the mind on the object. So Sama Sankaba among the eight path factors has that function. It is not thinking because at the moment of uh, enlightenment there is no thinking but the awareness of or consciousness of the Nibbana. So the Sama Sankaba among the eight path factors means a mental factor that takes the mind to the object or that puts the mind onto the object. And it is an important factor because if it does not put the mind on the object, the mind cannot know the object. If it does not take the consciousness on the object, then consciousness will not see the true nature of the object. So, Samma Sankapa is also an important factor and since only when it puts the mind on the object there can be understanding of the object, it is grouped as understanding of, or it is grouped under understanding. Now, the eight path factors are grouped into three groups, right? A group of sila, a group of samadhi, and group of panya. So, number three, four, and five are grouped as sila, because samavaja, right speech, means abstention from wrong speech. And samakamanta, right action, means abstention from wrong action. And samajiva means abstention from wrong livelihood. So, abstention means when you say, Panadipata viramanisi kabadang samadhiyami, you are saying, I will abstain from killing living beings and so on. So, sila means abstention. So, abstention from wrong speech, wrong action and wrong livelihood are grouped as sila factors. So, these three are sila factors. And then, six, seven and eight are grouped as samadhi factors. Because samadhi can arise only when there is a thing. If you do not practice mindfulness, you cannot get concentration. And if you do not make effort, you cannot be mindful. So both effort and mindfulness support concentration. So they are grouped together as concentration group. Now, number one and number two are grouped as panya group, understanding group. Actually, number one is the real understanding. So, number one is the mental state that really understands the true nature of things, that really understands Nibbana. But number two is also important because if it does not 
put the mind on the object, right understanding cannot understand. And so it is grouped with samadhiti or right understanding in the understanding group. So there are three groups. The eight factors are divided into three groups. The group of sila, group of samadhi, and group of panya. So, when we practice, the first we do is practice sila, sila factors. We have to purify our sila before we practice meditation. It is a prerequisite. If our sila is not pure, our meditation will not be successful. So, the first thing we do is purify our sila. And so the three middle ones, three, four, and five, are actually to be practiced first. And after that, we practice the right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. Once concentration is obtained, then we begin to see the true nature of things, and we begin to see, say, Nibbana if we are successful. And so, Samadhiti and Samasangaba come last. But Samadhiti has varieties. Believing or understanding of the Kama and its results is also called Samadhiti. Or let us say, belief in the law of karma is also called samadhi. And understanding the true nature of things, like vipassana, knowledge, is also called samadhi. So there are different kinds of samadhi. And then at the moment of maga, path consciousness, then there is path samadhi. And at the moment of pala, I mean fruition consciousness, there is uh, fruition samadhi, and then at the reviewing stage, there is reviewing samadhi. So there are different kinds of samadhi, but the best and the highest of this samadhi is the understanding that arises at the moment of enlightenment. But before we reach the moment of enlightenment, we have to practice. We have to practice all these factors. So all these factors are both mundane and supramundane again. So when we are practicing vipassana meditation, we are developing these eight factors as mundane factors. And when, say, we are successful and we reach enlightenment, then they become supramundane. So the factors of path are both mundane and supramundane, and what we develop, what we practice, is the mundane eight factors, not the supramundane eight factors, because actually supramundane eight factors are just the outcome of the practice of mundane eight factors. So, what is important for us is this mundane eight factors, and we must practice, we must develop these factors so that we reach the supramundane factors, or the stage of the supramundane factors. So these are called the magganga, huh? members of the path. Members of the path uh, means those that arise at the moment of magga consciousness. So at the Maga consciousness, these eight arise and they are called path factors or Maganga. And they arise before the Maga moment, I mean during the, the moments of Vipassana meditation. And they are also called Maganga because Maga can mean preliminary Maga and the real Maga. So the enlightenment stage is called the real maga, and the vipassana stage is called preliminary maga. So in order to reach the real maga, we practice the preliminary maga. So when we practice preliminary maga, 
we are developing these eight factors of maga. And when they become mature, then they develop and the eight supramundane factors arise at the moment of enlightenment. So these are the eight factors of path and altogether there are 37 of them. Four foundations of mindfulness, four supreme efforts, four means of accomplishment, five faculties, five powers, seven factors of enlightenment and eight uh, path factors. Now let us go to this chart. So how many mental states are treated in this section? There are 14 of them. Vidya is one, Sati one, Amoha one, and so on. So the 14 mental states are treated in this section. And the first one, Vidya, is included in Adipada, a means of accomplishment, uh, Indriya, Fakaldi, Bala, Power, Bojanga, factors of enlightenment, and Maganga, factors of path. So we take Samabhadana, the supreme effort, as four. And so four plus one, two, three, four, five, we get nine. And the same with Sati. Now, Sati Patana, there are four Sati Patanas, and so we take them as four. And then Sati is mentioned among the Indriyas, Balas, Bojangas, and Magangas. And so uh, Sati is included in the eight of them. And Amoha or Panya, five. It is mentioned among Adipada, Indriya, Bala, Bojanga, and Maganga. Ikagata, four. Indriya, Bala, Bojanga, and Maganga. Sadha, only two. Indriya and Bala. And Vidaka is only one. Maganga. Pasadhi, one. As Pasadhi Sambojanga. And Piti, as Piti Sambojanga. Tatra Majatada. Equanimity, as Upika Sambojanga. And Chanda as Chanda Adipada or means of accomplishment, Cheta as means of accomplishment, Samavacha as path factor, Samakamanda, Sama Ajiva as path factors. So one Viriya is mentioned nine times by different names in this section. Four Samabhadanas, one Adipada, one Indriya and so on. We must understand these names also so that in our reading we see these names, we understand. Otherwise we will be lost. We will not understand what the book is saying about. So it is important that we are familiar with these factors, are familiar with these ultimate realities and that are included in different categories. So there are 37 body bhakya dhammas and what we call the dispensation of Buddha is just these 37 mental states. Okay. You have questions? Mm -hmm. You just mentioned that uh, these 37 mental states is a uh, Buddha dispensation. But among these 37 mental states, some are overlapping. So, can it be 37 or 37? Actually, there are only 14, right? Only 14 of them are treated, actually. But they have different aspects, and so one and the same mental state is given different names, so that we say, and there are 37 bodhipakya dhammas or 37 members of enlightenment. But in reality, according to the ultimate reality, there are only 14. Okay.
Well, there is one question here. Under the explanation of powers, Seattle mentions that wholesomeness cannot be shaken by unwholesomeness, but unwholesomeness can be shaken by wholesomeness. Why is this so? This is the nature of wholesome and unwholesome states. Unwholesome states are said to be those that can be or that are to be abandoned. In Pali, they are called Bahataba. But wholesome states are never mentioned as Bahataba, or those that can be abandoned or that can be eradicated. So the only you know, wholesome states have this ability to destroy or to eradicate the unwholesome states. Like when a person gets enlightenment, at the moment of enlightenment, there arises the path consciousness and its concomitants. So path consciousness is a wholesome mental state and so the mental states also are wholesome at that time. Those mental states, actually, the understanding among them can eradicate the mental defilements. Now, at the moment of first stage of enlightenment, the wrong view and doubt are eradicated. So, it is the nature of wholesome, that the wholesome states, that they can eradicate the unwholesome mental states, but unwholesome mental states cannot eradicate wholesome mental states. If the unwholesome mental states were able to eradicate wholesome mental states, we would be lost. <laughs> because we have, we have so, so much unwholesome mental states in our mind, and wholesome mental states would not get chance to arise in our minds. So, it is a nature that the nature of the wholesome mental states to be able to eradicate unwholesome mental states. And if this is so, why can Kusala Chaitas be followed by Akusala Chaitas? Now, wholesome consciousness and unwholesome consciousness, strictly speaking, they cannot follow immediately after each other. That means Kusala cannot follow the Akusala immediately and Akusala cannot follow Kusala immediately. Now you have studied the thought processes. So when you look at the thought processes, after the Javanas, there are always Bhavangas. There are always life continuum moments, thousands of moments of life continuum before another wholesome or unwholesome consciousness arises. So, the Kusala Chaitas uh, cannot be followed by Akusala Chaitas or Akusala Chaitas cannot be followed by Kusala Chaitas. Now, there is another relationship between Kusala and Akusala and that is the relationship of strong support, Upanishaya. So, as Upanishaya, Kusala can support, I mean, wholesome chitta can support uh, unwholesome chitta and unwholesome chitta can support kusala, uh, wholesome chitta. That means, suppose I did some akusala, and then I know that this akusala is going to give me uh, bad results in the future, and so I want to at least get away from the consequences of those akusala. So I do kusala now. So my doing kusala now is influenced by that akusala in the past. In that way, kusala can be a strong support condition for akusala and akusala can be a strong su support condition for kusala. So in this way, uh, they can be supporting each other. But kusala, as I said before, cannot follow Akusala or Akusala cannot follow Akusala immediately. So that there must be 
moments of bohangas and moments of other uh, types of consciousness between kusala and akusala. When I meditate on what, concentration, there is a lot of pressure on the forehead that remains. How can I remove such sensation? Now, you do not remove the sensation. You just try to understand the sensation. So that is the important thing. When people feel something like sensation here or pain, they think that they are they are going to try to get rid of that pain, uh, that here is the sensation. But a vipassana is not not like that. Now, Buddha said, uh, uh, there are three kinds of sensations. And it is for the full understanding of these sensations that you practice the full foundations of mindfulness. So that means, let us say, when you have pain, and you try to be mindful of it, it is not for getting rid of them, but to understand them, to understand them correctly, to understand them fully, to understand that what you think to be a solid pain is actually not one solid thing, that it is composed of the small moments of pain, and also this pain arises and disappears. So you get the full understanding of, of pain. And through the strong concentration, the pain may disappear. So disappearance of pain is not the aim in trying to be mindful of pain. And so here also you have the pressure on the forehead just Concentrate on that place and be mindful or make mental notes as pressure, 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 pressure. Or if it is heaviness there, heavy, 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 and so on. And don't want it to go away. If you want it to go away, it may stay longer with you. <laughs> because somehow you have, you have some, some kind of attachment to it. So just be neutral towards it and just uh, like a spectator. Huh? Now, when you are watching something happening at a distance, you know what's happening there, but you are not involved in it. So in the same way, uh, you have a, a sensation, whatever sensation it is, you have a sensation there, you just see them as just a sensation and not your sensation. Or not, that, not that you are uh, experiencing that sensation. If you connect the sensation with you, let's say I, huh? if you connect the sensation with I, it will become worse. It will become more painful or more severe, and it may stay with you longer. So whether it is with you or not is not important, but what is important is you understand it while it is there. So you pay close attention to the sensation and hear the pressure, and through concentration, it will disappear. But don't want it to disappear. Uh, just watch it and let it go by itself. So, whatever sensations you feel, don't try to get rid of it. Stay with it. And be mindful of it and understand it. Yeah, thank you very much, Sadong. So uh, I think we shall end tonight's lecture here.